Worry is the interest paid by those who borrow trouble. George Washington. Oh, hi. Mr. Lahasky here. And today, we're going to elect our first president and put the new Constitution to the test. You'll remember that under the Articles of Confederation, the United States had no executive branch and no chief executive. This stemmed from a desire among the founders to avoid vesting too much power in any one person. However, the inability of the federal government to respond to a crisis during Shays' Rebellion caused many to rethink that decision. So during the Constitutional Convention in 1787, the founders retooled the government, outfitting it with a president to oversee the new executive branch. When the Constitution was ratified, it became time to select the first president. For the founders, the choice was obvious. George Washington, a Virginia plantation owner, had been a key player in every stage of the United States creation. Before commanding the Continental Army in the Revolutionary War, he had been a delegate to the Continental Congress. After independence was achieved, he was chosen to preside over the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. Washington was universally respected and was the obvious choice to become the first president, an honor that he reluctantly but dutifully accepted. Washington's eight years as president witnessed the first tests of American democracy under the Constitution. The example that Washington set for the presidency itself has been followed by nearly every president since, and many of Washington's recommendations upon leaving the office endured long after his departure. But perhaps the most consequential development of Washington's presidency didn't involve Washington at all, but rather they took shape in debates between members of his cabinet. But before we dive in, Let's ask a big question. Should the United States strive to be a world power or an ideological leader? This question is no less relevant today than it was in 1789. When Washington was elected, the United States was a blank slate. It had land, resources, and a population that was energized and motivated. But the trajectory of the nation's growth was yet unknown. Alexander Hamilton and many like him envisioned the United States as an international heavyweight one that could challenge the traditional balance of power in the Western world. On the other hand, Thomas Jefferson wanted to turn the traditional notion of the nation state on its ear. He envisioned a country whose goal was not the pursuit of economic or political power, but rather the unmitigated exercise of liberty. Throughout much of this country's history, these competing visions have directed the national conversation. But in the mid 20th century, it became clear that Hamilton's had won out. Indeed, since the close of World War II, the United States has focused intensely on maintaining its position as a global superpower. But what principles have we sacrificed in this pursuit? Should we be making attempts to correct course and return to a Jeffersonian model that prioritizes freedom and equality? And if so, is it even possible to make such a correction? Let's get to the root of the debate, then you decide. When George Washington took office in 1789, it is quite possible that his greatest responsibility would be to define the office to which he was elected. This is our first big idea. Because the presidency is vaguely defined in the Constitution, George Washington set careful precedents that defined the office for centuries. A precedent is an example, usually one that serves as a guide for the future. George Washington was truly a president of precedents. He was acutely aware that his actions as the country's first president would serve as the standard for future holders of that office. You see, Article 2 of the Constitution lays out the specific powers of the president. For example, the president is charged with negotiating treaties, nominating Supreme Court justices, and directing foreign policy. But the Constitution offers no advice on how the president should act how the president should dress, how others should conduct themselves around the president. In these areas, Washington's actions served as examples. He insisted, for example, that he be addressed only as Mr. President, although the terms excellency and his highness had been thrown around as possibilities. He wore clothing that typified a lawyer or politician of the day, rejecting the elegant robes and capes common among European monarchs. Washington expected people to stand when he entered a room, but not to bow, as was the instinct of many. Washington knew that Americans were wary of their history with monarchy, so to dispel these concerns, 
he embraced his humility and carefully avoided any behavior or tradition that might be interpreted as kingly. Decisions like these revealed the vision that Washington had for the highest office in the land, and future presidents took care to follow many of his examples. But while Washington was perhaps solely responsible for defining the presidency for centuries to come, the most consequential debate over the future of the United States was actually unfolding in his cabinet. This is our second big idea. Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton harbored competing visions for the United States, which led to intense debates within the Washington administration. Washington's first presidential cabinet had only four members. John Knox served as Secretary of War, Edmund Randolph was the first Attorney General, Thomas Jefferson was named Secretary of State, and the first Secretary of the Treasury was Alexander Hamilton. An intense rivalry soon developed between Jefferson and Hamilton, thanks in part to their competing visions for the United States. Let's take a look at the origin and nature of these visions. Hamilton was a lawyer and a statesman from New York. Perhaps the most influential Federalist during the Great Debate, he was instrumental in the Constitution's ratification. Hamilton was known for his belief in a strong central government, and his vision for America reflected that. Hamilton envisioned the United States as a global economic power whose economy was built on manufacturing and trade. This stands to reason given his New York roots, a state whose economy was itself built on manufacturing and trade. He believed the United States should grow to become interconnected with Europe and other global powers, especially Great Britain. He saw great potential in the shared culture, history, and economic interests between the United States and its former mother country. Thomas Jefferson stood in contrast to Hamilton in nearly every way. Jefferson was a Virginia planter and slave owner whose aversion to a strong central government should come as no surprise given his home state. He wanted the states to retain certain powers in order to keep the federal government in check. Jefferson valued liberty above all else, which is evidenced by his authorship of the Declaration of Independence and the role he played in the American Revolution. Accordingly, Jefferson envisioned the United States as a leader in liberty. He cared not for profitable trade relationships, banks, or manufacturing. He saw an American economy that would be sustained by agriculture and the yeoman farmer, a self-sufficient, individualistic, and industrious brand of American. Jefferson preferred the United States as an isolationist nation that avoided foreign entanglements, especially with old world monarchies. If there were to be alliances, he preferred that they exist with nations who shared his own notions of liberty and democracy, namely revolutionary France. These two incompatible visions for the United States formed the basis of the first political parties, which coalesced around Hamilton and Jefferson, but more on that later. Let's take a look now at how the differences between these two cabinet members affected policy within the Washington administration. Here's our third big idea. Jefferson and Hamilton first squared off on the issue of the United States economy, which led to debates about the expansion of federal power and constitutional elasticity. As Secretary of the Treasury, Hamilton was in charge of setting up the nation's economy. This was a position he was well equipped for. Hamilton had always had a knack for money and accounting. It's said that he was placed in charge of a Caribbean import and export firm at the age of 12. Under Washington, Hamilton drew up a multi-point plan for the American economy. The plan was outlined in his Report on Public Credit, and it's worth a close look here. First, Hamilton wanted the United States federal government to assume all state debts. Remember, the states had incurred war debt during the Revolution, and some states were having a hard time paying it off. Hamilton wanted the U.S. government to take this debt off the state's hands. This would allow the U.S. federal government to establish credit, which it would need in order to borrow money from international banks in the future. A quick life lesson to explain this concept. So, we've kind of been conditioned to think that debt is a bad thing, and it definitely can be if you get yourself in a situation where you can't pay it off. But debt can also be beneficial. For example, it might be a good idea to get yourself a credit card in your late teens or early 20s. Every time you use the card, the bank is giving you a loan for whatever it is you're purchasing. When you pay off that loan at the end of every month, you're demonstrating that you can be trusted to borrow money. 
This activity is recorded and reported, and it contributes to your credit score. If you have a good credit score, banks trust you, and they're more willing to give you loans for bigger purchases like a car or a house. This is essentially what Hamilton wants to accomplish. By taking on state debts and proving that the federal government can be trusted to make its payments, the United States would establish creditworthiness in the eyes of nations and banks around the world. Hamilton recognized that with the new national debt he was proposing, the United States would need new sources of revenue so that the government would be able to make its payments on time. To this end, he proposed two ideas as part of his financial plan. First, he suggested an excise tax on whiskey. Second, he proposed a tariff on imported goods. The tariff would serve as a revenue generator, but would also protect American manufacturing firms from foreign competition allowing them to grow into the backbone of the U.S. economy. The final part of Hamilton's plan was to establish a national bank in order to manage all of this new income and debt. The creation of the bank was the linchpin of Hamilton's financial plan, and as it turned out, it was the most controversial aspect of it as well. If Hamilton's plan was put into place, it would change the very trajectory of the United States. But standing in its way was Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson recognized that Hamilton's plan would create an America very different than the one he had in mind. Accordingly, Jefferson opposed each part. Jefferson recognized that the assumption of state debt by the federal government would increase the government's responsibility and its authority. This concerned him, since he preferred that states be in charge of their own affairs. He also pointed out that many southern states had already paid off their debts. He didn't think it fair that southern states might be taxed by the federal government to pay off debts incurred by the northern states. Furthermore, Jefferson wanted the United States to be self-sufficient, so the prospect of taking on large debts, especially loans from European countries down the road, concerned him greatly. Jefferson found the whiskey tax to be oppressive, and he worried about the effect it would have on farmers. As for the tariff, he recognized that this would hurt southern states, since their agricultural economy necessitated the import of more goods than in the North. The tariff was also designed to grow U.S. manufacturing and trade markets, which stood in contrast to Jefferson's vision of an agrarian society. But the biggest objection that Jefferson had to the financial plan was to the bank. The prospect of establishing a national bank appalled Thomas Jefferson, and he questioned if it were even legal to do. Jefferson pointed out that Nowhere in the Constitution does it say that the federal government can operate a central bank. He feared that the establishment of the National Bank was an unauthorized expansion of federal power, one that could lead to corruption at the highest level. Hamilton found justification for the bank in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, which says that the government has the power to do things that are, quote, necessary and proper for the maintenance of the republic. This is known as the Elastic Clause since it can be stretched and interpreted to include powers that aren't necessarily spelled out in the Constitution. This issue of constitutional elasticity and the National Bank turned into a debate over how we should interpret the Constitution. Two ideas emerged, again around Hamilton and Jefferson's opinions. Jefferson and his followers were known as strict constructionists. They believed that the Constitution should be interpreted literally, and that any government power not explicitly spelled out in the Constitution was not permitted. Quite simply, he argued that if the Constitution doesn't say you can have a national bank, you can't have a national bank. The core tenet of strict interpretation was to keep the federal government from growing too big and powerful. Hamilton and his followers, on the other hand, were known as loose constructionists. They argued that through the Elastic Clause, the Constitution gave the federal government implied powers, or powers not explicitly listed in the Constitution. Loose interpretation of the Constitution was grounded in the belief that the federal government could grow so long as that growth was necessary and proper for the maintenance of the nation. In short, since the Constitution did not explicitly forbid the creation of the bank, Hamilton thought it fair game. To give you an idea of how tense things were between Jefferson and Hamilton, check out this clip from HBO's miniseries, John Adams. In this scene, you'll see Hamilton explaining the rationale for his financial plan and Jefferson's disgust with it. 
I must find Philadelphia much changed. There was more change than I could have imagined, Mr. Hamilton. Not the city itself. All cities swallow everything in their way. That's no surprise to me. That's why I abhor them. But I've been, as you know, in revolutionary France, where the streets are filled with the songs of liberty and brotherhood and the overthrow of ancient tyrannies of Europe, and to return from there to this our cradle of revolution and find the dinner table chatter is all of money and banks and authority is an unwelcome surprise. Unwelcome, perhaps, but necessary. I must admit, Mr. Hamilton, I uh, a little uncertain <laughs> as to the purpose of the Treasury Department. <laughs> no doubt its function will reveal itself to me in good time. The future prosperity of this nation rests chiefly in trade. Trade depends, among other things, on the willingness of other nations to lend us money. And how would you propose to establish international credit? Our first step would be to incur a national debt. The greater the debt, the greater the credit. And to that end, I have recommended to the President that Congress adopt all the debts incurred by the individual states during the war through a national bank. The idea being that if the states owe Congress money, then other nations will feel more inclined to lend it to us. If the states are indebted to a central authority, it increases the power of the central government. There you have it exactly. The greater the government's responsibility, the greater its authority. Mm. The moneyed interest in this country is all in the north, so the wealth and power would inevitably be concentrated there in the federal government, to the expense of the south. If that is the case, it is unavoidable if the union is to be preserved. I fear our revolution will have been in vain if a Virginia farmer is to be held in hock to a New York stock jobber, who in turn is in hock to a London banker. The opportunities for uh, avarice and corruption would certainly prove irresistible. Well, there you have it, as I have heard said. If men were angels, then no government would be necessary. <laughs> well, uh, well, sadly, that is... Man, you could cut that tension with a knife. For an interpretation that's a little more lighthearted, and one that treats Hamilton a little more favorably, here's a clip from the musical Hamilton by Lin-Manuel Miranda, who turns this debate into a cabinet rap battle. Ladies and gentlemen, you could have been anywhere in the world tonight, but you're here with us in New York City. Are you ready for a cabinet meeting? The issue on the table, Secretary Hamilton's plan to assume state debt and establish a national bank. Secretary Jefferson, you have the floor, sir. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We fought for these ideals, we shouldn't settle for less. These are wise words, enterprising men quote them. Don't act surprised, you guys, cause I wrote them. Ow, but Hamilton forgets. His plan would have the government assume states' debt. Now place your bets as to who that benefits. The very seat of government where Hamilton sits. Not true. Oh, if the shoe fits, wear it. If New York's in debt, why should Virginia bear it? Uh, our debts are paid, I'm afraid. Don't tax the South, cause we got it made in the shade. In Virginia, we plant seeds in the ground. We create. You just want to move our money around. This financial plan is an outrageous demand, and it's too many damn pages for any man to understand. Stand with me in the land of the free. Pray to God we never see Hamilton's candidacy. Look, when Britain taxed our tea, we got frisky. Imagine what gonna happen when you try to tax our whiskey. Thank you, Secretary Jefferson. <laughs> Secretary Hamilton, your response. Thomas, that was a real nice declaration. Welcome to the present. We're running a real nation. Would you like to join us? Or stay mellow, doing whatever the hell it is you do in Monticello. <laughs> if we assume the debts, the union gets a new line of credit, a financial diuretic, how do you not get it? If we're aggressive and competitive, the union gets a boost. You'd rather give it a sedative? A civics lesson from a slaver. Hey, neighbor, your debts are paid because you don't pay for labor. We plant seeds in the South. We create. They keep ranting. 
we know who's really doing the planting. And you know the thing, Mr. Age of Enlightenment, don't lecture me about the war. You didn't fight in it. You think I'm frightened of you, man? We almost died in the trench while you were off getting high with the French. Yeah. Thomas Jefferson always hesitant with the president. Medicine, there isn't a plan he hasn't jettisoned. Madison, you mad as a hat of sun. Take your medicine. Damn, you in worse shape than the national debt is in. Sitting there useless as two shits. Hey, turn around, bend over. I'll show you where my shoe fits. Excuse me. Madison Jefferson, take a walk. Hamilton, take a walk. <laughs> We're going to reconvene after a brief recess. <laughs> Hamilton, sir, a word. You don't have the votes. You don't have the votes. <laughs> You're going to need congressional approval and you don't have the votes. Such a blunder. Sometimes it makes me wonder why I even bring the thunder. Why he even brings the thunder. You want to pull yourself together? I'm sorry, these Virginians are birds of a feather. Young man, I'm from Virginia, so watch your mouth. So we let Congress get held hostage by the South. You need the votes. No, we need bold strokes. We need this No, plan. you need to convince more folks. Well, James Madison won't talk to me. That's a non-starter. Ah, winning was easy, young man. Governing's They're harder. They're being intransigent. You have to find a compromise. They don't have a plan. They just hate mine. Convince them otherwise. And what happens if I don't get congressional approval? I imagine they'll call for your removal. Sir. Figure it out, Alexander. That's an order from your commander. Indeed. Thomas Jefferson's disapproval was a huge obstacle. Jefferson's popularity in the United States was probably second only to George Washington's, and many Southern congressmen took their cues from Thomas Jefferson. Without his support, Hamilton's plan might be dead on arrival. So the two struck a deal. Jefferson consented to the assumption of state debt, the whiskey tax, and the National Bank. In return, Hamilton agreed to drop the tariff and support relocating the nation's capital to the south, to the banks of the Potomac River between Maryland and Virginia. The relocation of the capital to Washington City assuaged some of Jefferson's fears, since Southerners would be able to keep a watchful eye on the growing national government. In 1790, the compromise was made official by act of Congress. Construction of the new capital began, and Hamilton's plan was implemented. By many accounts, Hamilton's plan was a huge success. It set the United States on a course that would one day render it a global economic power, just as Alexander envisioned. But there were some troubles along the way, and the new government under the Constitution was still being put to the test. This is our fourth big idea. The Whiskey Rebellion demonstrated that the government under the Constitution was strong enough to respond to a crisis though some saw it as a sign the government was growing too powerful. So remember, Hamilton chose a tax on whiskey as the main revenue generator for the federal government. But as has often been the case in American history, taxes were a sore subject. This one was particularly upsetting to farmers on the western frontier because out there, whiskey was a way of life. In many places on the rural frontier, whiskey was literally safer to drink than the water. Additionally, the distance and terrain that separated places like Pittsburgh from eastern population centers made it very difficult and expensive for farmers to transport and sell their surplus grain. But by distilling that harvest into whiskey, they could preserve it and ship it to eastern markets. Additionally, because the demand for whiskey was stable in the United States, it was used as a form of currency in remote areas. American paper currency was rare on the frontier, so merchants accepted whiskey as a form of payment for goods and services. This whiskey economy meant that the West was hit especially hard by the excise tax. They responded accordingly. Westerners who opposed the whiskey tax took a page from the old Patriot playbook. They formed committees on correspondence and passed resolutions declaring the tax unjust. They tarred and feathered tax collectors and they took to the streets. By 1794, the violence had intensified, and 5,000 armed Westerners prepared to march on Pittsburgh. At Hamilton's urging, Washington raised an army of over 13,000 soldiers, got on a horse, and marched them to meet the rebellion. When word of the army's size reached Western Pennsylvania, and when the rebels learned that it was led by Washington himself, they dispersed. 
The show of force by the Washington administration ended the Whiskey Rebellion. But in conversations that took place in the wake of the rebellion, some questioned the federal government's response. Hamilton and Washington believed that the suppression of the rebellion proved that the Constitution had passed an important test and could respond to a crisis, a test that the Articles of Confederation had failed during Shays' Rebellion. On the other hand, many Westerners and Southerners viewed the armed response as an example of runaway government power. Jefferson had once remarked that a little rebellion every now and then was a good thing, as it kept the government in check and safeguarded liberty. He even remarked in a 1787 letter that the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. But for better or for worse, Hamilton's vision for a strong central government was clearly winning out. By the time the Whiskey Rebellion had ended, Thomas Jefferson resigned his cabinet post and retreated to Virginia, though he continued to influence political decisions in a big way and would soon return to public life. Indeed, the United States was undergoing a significant transformation under the Washington administration. But Europe, too, was rapidly changing. Our final big idea outlines the foreign policy issues during Washington's presidency. The French Revolution and subsequent war between Britain and France dominated U.S. foreign policy debates. Ultimately, Washington pursued a course of neutrality. When the French Revolution broke out in 1789, Americans celebrated. They viewed the uprising as a continuation of the democratic movement that had begun with their own revolution against the British. But as you may remember from your world or European history class, the French Revolution soon spun out of control. Europe found itself engulfed in war, and Americans grew divided on which side to support. On one hand, Alexander Hamilton lobbied for support of Great Britain against the French. Hamilton's vision for the country as an economic power depended on a strong trade relationship with Britain, so he felt compelled to intervene on their behalf. But Thomas Jefferson and many liberty-loving Southerners refused to turn their backs on the French. They argued that the ideology of the French Revolution was sound and needed to be protected from despotic monarchies like Britain, who hoped to reverse the revolution and restore the French monarchy. Perched upon the horns of a dilemma, Washington ultimately decided on a course of neutrality. To that end, he issued the Proclamation of Neutrality, which declared the United States would not take sides in the conflict. Though at the time a very unpopular move since it alienated both Hamilton and Jefferson supporters, Washington may well have saved the Republic. He recognized the country was in no condition, economic or otherwise, to enter into a major war with Europe. Though he was a world-famous general, all of Washington's actions as president were designed to keep America out of foreign wars. After eight years as president, George Washington shocked the country and the world by announcing he would not seek a third term. Washington remained popular among the people and probably could have remained president as long as he wanted. Nonetheless, he set an important precedent by stepping down. For almost 150 years, the two-term tradition was upheld by every American president. By stepping down voluntarily, he demonstrated that a peaceful transition of power was possible. It has remained a hallmark of American democracy ever since. So after all that, whose vision for the country was best? Hamilton's desire for global influence or Jefferson's plea to honor the ideals of the revolution? Certainly. That remains up for debate, but Washington made his opinion known before leaving office. In one of his final acts as president, Washington issued a farewell address in which he conveyed his own vision. In it, we can see the influence and respect for both Hamilton and Jefferson's ideas. Washington argued that the goal of American policy should always be peace, that the country should embrace open commercial relations with other nations but avoid foreign entanglements that might threaten American neutrality. Finally, Washington warned against the pitfalls of partisan infighting. He encouraged Americans not to form divisive political parties that might threaten the Union. While many of Washington's recommendations were followed, this one was not. By the time he left office, the first political parties in the United States were clearly defined, and the struggle between the two would set the stage for the events of the coming decades. Even today, 
the echoes of these first debates still ring in our national discourse. Next time, we'll look more closely at those political parties and close out the 18th century with the presidency of John Adams. See you then.